What's going on, love, my YouTube family? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today is part three of our ATI reading series breakdown. If you haven't already watched the first two parts of the ATI reading, I'm going to go ahead and leave links up here in the corner. I want to make sure that you follow those because it's really important to understand the general overallization of what the ATI tease is covering. But let's go ahead and get started with part three. Before we begin, if you are new to my channel, make sure that you hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to get notifications when I do post. I do post new ATI tease content every Monday up until the point where we finally finish it and you pass your ATI tease. Make sure that you like this video, it lets others know that I'm doing a good job and really helps out my channel. And of course, share this with your friends and all of your other pre-nursing students that are really interested in starting their nursing journey. So to begin the third part of the reading portion of ATITs, we're going to start out by discussing making inferences as well as drawing conclusions. So what exactly is that? Understanding inference questions, ask about logical implications and deductions that can be drawn directly from the passage. They usually contain phrases such as, what does the author imply about blank? Or, what can be inferred about blank? Additional phrases you might see is most likely or potentially probably. A very common inference question is, based on the passage, which of the following is true? The correct answer to these questions are usually logically implied from the passage. So what exactly does that mean? That means that you are not going to find the answer directly from the passage. So this is something that is implied that you have to figure out. So let's move on to our first example. So moving on to example number one. Close at hand is a bridge over the river themes. An admirable vantage ground for us is to make a survey. The river flows beneath, barges pass, laden with timber, bursting with corn. They're on one side of the domes and spears of the city, and on the other side, Westminster and the House of Parliament. It is the place to stand on by the house dreaming, and not now. Now we are pressed for time. Now we are here to consider facts. Now we must fix our eyes upon the procession and the procession of the sons and educated men. So according to the passage, Wolf chooses the setting of the bridge because it is either A, is conducive to a mood of fanciful reflection, B, provides a good view of the procession of the sons of educated men, C, is within sight of the historic episodes to which she alludes, or D, is symbolic of the legacy of the past and present sons of educated men. And of course, the correct answer is B. You must deduce from the information that was given. Normally, we'd be on the bridge of dream and have fanciful reflection, but that's not the case now. Now, we have to do something while standing on the bridge. What is that something else? fixing our eyes on the procession of the sons of educated men. So yes, the correct answer is B, provides a good view of the procession of the sons of educated men. So moving on to drawing conclusions, they require some logic just like the inference questions, except they focus on the overall conclusion that can be made from the passage. These questions can ask about the overall idea that is implied in the selection versus the specific details. So let's move on to example number one. Polio and his father have been looking forward to their fishing trip for weeks. They didn't take much food with them on the trip. When they started fishing, they were quickly approached by a ranger. He asked Julio's father if he had obtained a fishing license to fish. Julio's father reached into his wallet and then had a terrified look on his face. Julio was disappointed that night as he ate dinner. So the question is, why did Julio and his father not take much food with them on the trip? They're asking, what is the conclusion of this passage? So was it A, they didn't want to eat too much, B, they didn't have any food at their home, C, they were planning on eating the fish they caught, or D, they didn't like to eat fish? The correct answer is C. The passage draws a conclusion that Julio and his father caught fish during the trip and then they would have been eating that fish for dinner. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like he had his permit, so 
Julio and his father didn't have any fish. So let's move on to understanding the differences between fact and opinion. So what's the difference? A fact is determined by a portion of text based on factual information and can be verified. That can be verified is very important. So an example of that is as of 2008, there was a total of 3.1 million registered nurses within the United States. That is a verifiable fact. So moving on to opinion, opinion is determined by the author's believed and is not based on any facts. For example, I love small dogs. That is my belief, that is my opinion. So that kind of helps you out a little bit in regards to fact versus opinions. But now we also have biases versus stereotypes. So a bias is a personal preference that may interfere with the author's ability to be objective. So for an example, an author likes versus dislikes. If someone is biased towards women, they might display a bias by hiring men that are not as qualified as women. That is a person's personal bias, as well as it could be an author's personal bias. And then you have stereotypes. Stereotypes is a generalization about a group. So for an example of that, a group of individuals whom all have a certain uh, characteristic shared among them. So senior citizens are bad drivers. That is considered a stereotype, and those are things that you're gonna see on the ATITs. So for this example, we're gonna go ahead and cover our CPR passage that we covered several videos ago. So I'm going to go ahead and read this over for you in case that you weren't privy to those uh, videos previously. So CPR, also known as cardiopulmonary resuscitation, is the American Heart Association started for attempting to save someone's life. It is a method used when a patient's heart has stopped beating. Most all approaches of CPR begin with resuscitation efforts via chest compressions. In order to perform chest compressions, the rescuer begins by placing both hands flat on the sternum of the patient's chest and begins pushing down consistently and firmly at equal intervals. Compressions are counted with an unofficial recommendation of 100 chest compressions per minute. For those trained in CPR, one of the best ways to remember the order in which we should administer CPR is to use the CAB mnemonic. CAB stands for circulation, airway, and breathing. The goal is to aid an unresponsive person to start breathing on their own. So the question is, the author states that one of the best ways to remember the order in which steps should be administered for CPR is to use the CAB mnemonic. The statement best describes which of the following. So here are our four choices. Is it A, it is a fact because CAB is a mnemonic and is easy to remember? Is it B, is it an opinion because the author is not able to determine what is best for all people? C, is it a fact because there is empirical research that proved this statement? Or D, is it an opinion because the author introduces it with, in my own opinion, phrase? To answer this question, we begin by breaking it down. So we have to determine if this passage is a fact or is it an opinion? Well, we know that it is an opinion because it is not based on empirical research. So it has to be an opinion. The only other choice that makes sense is B, and that is the correct answer. While both B and D do state that they are opinions, the author never introduces the phrase, in my opinion, so we know that that is untrue. And we also know that the author cannot determine what is best for all people in regards to this passage. So yes, the correct answer is B. So next we're gonna move on understanding point of view tone as well as evaluating an argument. So starting with point of view, what exactly does that mean? It refers to how the author feels about the passage and the specific opinions she or he holds about the passage. So when we're determining point of view, we're looking for a couple different things. Is the passage a narrative? informational passage or a persuasive passage and is the passage based on verifiable facts or is it the author's opinion so let's go on and move on to an example in regards to what exactly is the author's point of view as a child i remember the hot summer evening spent outside with my parents naming the birds we heard but could not see in the dying light our perception was limited to only one sense our hearing from tree to tree echoed a symphony of calls. Was that a blue jay, 
a Baltimore Oriole, or a chameleon of birds, the Mockingbird. As I tested my fledging ear, I turned to my father for reassurance. Behind his discerning eyes lay something that I wouldn't be able to identify until many decades later. Was it, dinner is ready, mother called. Our Audubon expedition would have to be continued another day. So the question is, the point of view from which the passage is told is best described as A. A young child communicating his or her emotions and perspectives. A third person narrative who is aware of every character's emotions. C. An adult reflective appreciatively on his youth. Or D. A third person narrative who tells a story through their own perspectives. And the correct answer is C, an adult reflective appreciatively on their youth. So as you can tell from the specific passage, it is from the point of a child because it starts with as a child. However, you know that it's being told from an adult point of view because they do use the reference many decades later. So yes, the correct answer is C. So moving on to tone. Tone refers to the author's attitude towards a subject and the mood of the passage. For example, Jennifer runs angrily towards the horizon versus Jennifer skips happily towards the horizon. In both examples, Jennifer is heading towards the horizon, but the effect is changed by the use of different word choices. So let's go on to our first example. So for our first example, it is part of the speech that was given by Martin Luther King Jr. And it is as follows. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check. A check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hollowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of grandulism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to raise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. So the question is, what was the tone of the I Have a Dream speech from Martin Luther King Jr.? Was it of outrage and anger, violent and agitated, or inspired and hopeful? And as you guessed, the correct answer is C. This is an inspired and hopeful passage from the I Have the Dream speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the last thing that we are going to cover in part three of the ATITs is evaluating an argument. So what is that? Within a passage, it is defined by determining the point the author is trying to make. So the claims an author makes must have evidence to back them up. That is how we evaluate an argument within a passage. So for this example, we have to determine what would strengthen Jennifer's argument. So here's Jennifer's argument. The new homeowners association regulates and requires the community to install a new sprinkler system. This will cost the average homeowner $1,000 and could increase property taxes. The new regulation will cause detrimental financial hardships to the average homeowner. So here are your choices. A. Most homeowners in the neighborhood do not have the money to install a new sprinkler system. B. It would take one year for the money spent on the installation of the sprinkler systems to reflect on lower water bills. C. The money to install the new sprinkler system is more than the average monthly water bill. Or D. The money saved from lower water bill makes up for the increase in property taxes. So the correct answer is A. The statement strengthens Jennifer's argument that the high initial costs are just too high. So really when you're answering these questions they can be difficult because you have to figure out what the author is claiming and then you have to try to find some kind of evidence to back up that claim when you're evaluating that argument. I hope this video is helpful for you. I am so happy we have finally finished part three of our four part series of 
reading portion of ATITs. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love to answer those questions. And of course, make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe on my videos. It really helps me out. But until next time, I will talk to you all again soon. Bye-bye.